We are delighted to be joined on the Emperor Podcast by the star of Elvis, Mr. Austin Butler. How are you, sir? I'm so glad to be here. I'm very <laughs> well. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I have to say, uh, when I saw the movie, I was a bit worried for your physical well-being because this seems like an incredibly arduous role. Mm. I mean, the movie covers Elvis's entire film career in about two minutes. And yeah. that seems like a lot of stuff to shoot. Yeah. So how tough was it for you to shoot this movie? It, it was, I've, I've never worked harder. I, um, I, it, it was wild watching the movie the other day because I realized how certain things that I may have obsessed and worked endlessly on for six months went by in the blink of an eye in the film. Yeah. Or they were edited down to two seconds or something. <laughs> and and then you just realize the amount of hours that go into every second of the film, every second of every performance. Yeah. And and at the end of the day, the whole thing is you don't want to see the homework. You don't want to see the practice. You want it to feel like it's happening for the very first time right here in front of our eyes. Absolutely. So it it uh for me it was it was this these endless hours of studying and watching Elvis and listening to Elvis and, and experimenting with different ways of embodying that. And, uh, that was either recording myself and, and playing my voice back and then his voice and kind of comparing and doing that over and over and over. Or I, I you know, I had incredible coaches that I worked with in dialect singing, karate, movement uh, <laughs> i had everything and i love so, that yeah. i love that because he was properly into his karate oh he was it was one of his greatest passions <laughs> it truly was there's amazing footage of him doing karate that you gotta see if you haven't seen it <laughs> somebody's done an edit online to kung fu fighting and it's and it's just one of the greatest videos <laughs> he could take multitudes did elvis yeah he, uh, he contained multitudes he, he really did and uh, i know that whenever you you first uh, got wind of this project that you sent a video of yourself singing Unchained Melody, mm -hmm. presumably the Unchained Melody that Elvis sang towards the end of his life. Is that yeah, the one you were? Yeah. yeah. Uh, have you looked back at that video recently? I've never looked back at the one that I did. That's interesting. No. Okay. Because I was wondering how far, how different your portrayal in that moment, yeah. trying to, you know, trying to audition, trying to catch Baz's eye, differs from the very, very final day you played Elvis. I, 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 it's interesting. I should look back at it at some point. I, that was, that was pivotal for me because it was, it was a moment where I'd been absorbing everything to do with Elvis. And my agent had said, you, you know, Baz has seen you act, but he hasn't seen you sing. So you should send him a song. So I was trying to come up with a song that I should send and I'm watching every bit of footage and I'm thinking which era do should I send a song from etc and I filmed Love Me Tender mm -hmm. and because I thought you know it's his first film and, and there's him saying Love Me Tender and, and so I, I filmed it and I watched it back and I just saw an impersonation and so I right. didn't send it Right. I thought there's no way that I can send this I'm, I'm just I can see myself it's all external and um, and then I, and I've told the story before, but essentially I, my mom passed away when I was 23 yeah. and I had this, this awful nightmare that she was dying again and woke up from that. And Elvis' mom died when he was 23. And so th that was this kind that was this connection. It was one of the first connections I had. And, um, and so I just, I, I thought, well, what if I just take this emotion, this, this very raw, truthful emotion that I have right here put it into a song and Unchained Melody was the first one that came to my mind because the lyrics, I thought, wow, this, I've, I've always imagined this to a romantic partner. This could be to uh, uh, my mom. Um, it, it also could be to his fans. It could be, there, there's so many ways you can interpret a song. But to me that day it was, what if I just sing this right now to my mom? And I sat down at the piano and I just woken up and I, I just, and I wasn't thinking about trying to look like Elvis or, or, or anything. It just was emotion. And while eventually then I got very specific about his physicality and everything, mm -hmm. that was, that became the foundation of it all for me, that, that song. Um, and that, that moment of, of realizing that it, it all had to come back to very human truths, very human emotion. I think not 
to give too much away. Obviously, it's it's a it's a biopic, so people know what what people know about Elvis's life. They know what happened mm-hmm. to Elvis. Um, it's a song you sing in the movie. It's a song that is performed in the movie. And yeah. I, what was that like? At what point in the process did you shoot that? Because it's a very different Elvis, and I wonder if the emotion yeah. that you were feeling on that day was the same emotion. Yeah, that was that was towards the end of filming, actually, and so it was this really trippy full circle experience where that was the very first thing that I had sent to Baz and it was the foundation of it for me. And then suddenly here we are, I think it was in the last week or two of shooting the film. And now I've been living with that role for two years at that point. And, and it was, it was really surreal for me and, um, and, and quite, moving because it, as well there were there were other things like the the what they lovingly refer to as the body adjustment suit that i was wearing um <laughs> I've, it, uh, I've never heard this yeah, about before yeah, Let's... You, you zipped into this thing that makes you l- a lot larger and yeah um and it, and it constricts your ribs and so i couldn't breathe fully and but when you watch the footage of elvis he can hardly get a breath in because he's also strapped into his jumpsuit at that time yeah and so there's so many of these moments that are these parallels of extreme empathy that i felt for him and 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 the feeling of when you watch him and he's struggling to get through a sentence but then you see him sing and it's and he just soars Mm -hmm. it's this beautiful powerful voice that comes out of him when he sings and there's these little smiles that he gives throughout the performance where priscilla told me the other day she goes you know he was smiling and and it was it was what i had thought too there's a couple different moments he smiles that i think for our different reasons but one of them she says he smiles because he hit that note because it was always a hard note for him to hit and you see him give this little (laughs) smile afterwards i thought that was really cute that's what's wild. I mean, there's there's some there's some great performances that are recreated in the uh, in the film, uh, the comeback special, for example, you know, and the oh, and yeah. the performance of If I Can Dream, which I think now having seen the film was always on the on the borderline on the cusp of being my favorite Elvis track, and mm-hmm. is now one hundred percent my favorite Elvis track. It's been in my head ever since. I Amazing. can't get out of my head, Austin. It is going around <laughs> my head constantly. But that's great. It's a good song to have going around your head. Yeah, uh, it is. But for me, there's a, there's a really interesting difference between the public Elvis, where you have to meticulously recreate his movements, his arm mm. movements when he's when he's singing, when he's pumping mm. up towards the end of "If I Can Dream," and the private Elvis. Mm. What was the difference between the two for you? How did you how did you find the private Elvis where there is no footage, where there is no obvious way in? Yeah, that that was that that was my fascination that was that was the thing that i was really trying to find the most and so for me there were certain keys like finding his anger you know you you hear stories about his the fact that he could snap in a moment and experience bouts of extreme anger Mm -hmm. um but you but most of the time he's on stage or in front of a camera and so he knows that he's being recorded so he's not going to release that there's two recordings there's one of his girlfriend that's probably about 59 60 anita wood was his girlfriend and she's accusing him of cheating on her on the phone and, and she's pressing into him over and over and he's mm-hmm. he he doesn't know he's being recorded and so he's he's, he's very polite and going no i didn't no i didn't no i didn't and eventually he explodes at her and, and not not horribly but you hear how the shift can happen so there's little things like that that i would find that would suddenly be this gold mine of uh, that that is like the seed that then can sprout inside for how to deal with how he deals with anger. Um, then then there's other things like the the little things. I mean, like we say, any any hero or, or, or any icon, you, you can sort of almost forget that they just did the mundane things. And so for me, it it wasn't a matter of of like trying to do any sort of acting technique. I just I wanted to experience what, as the closest that I could to what he w- would have felt when he woke up or when he brushed his teeth or when, like those little things, how, how would he have ordered coffee? And so for me, it was like experimenting in the real world when the cameras aren't rolling. Mm. Um, so 
I tried to, I basically lived that way for two years, just trying to, so that way I didn't have the feeling it was a lateral movement into action and cut, you know, Yeah, yeah. rather than me feeling like here I am Austin. And then suddenly I've got to go like, okay, now it's Elvis time, you know? And, and, and that feels like this massive shift and you get this, it would feel inauthentic. So I, for me, I didn't know another way, but I, cause I, otherwise I thought I was just going to feel like a fraud as soon as you go into speaking as him or something. It, so my, my thing was, I just tried to merge that as much as possible for the duration. Yeah. Cause I, I've, I've read uh, various uh, interviews with, with you and with Baz as well. And Baz says he didn't know you weren't, you weren't from the <laughs> South until, yeah, yeah. until kind of after filming. Yeah. So you stayed very much in that, in that zone. Yeah, which is, I'd had about a month prior to meeting Baz that I was doing nothing else but researching this. And so I'd already given over into, I, I don't know what I would have done if I didn't actually get the part. I would, it would have been so <laughs> tragic because <laughs> I'd been living with it for so long, but I, it was five months before I actually got the part. So and that I treated it like I already had it. So I, I was, I was obsessed. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, what about, what about uh, Baz during this period, this preparation period you know, before, before day one? Uh, of shooting yeah how how closely involved was he was he constantly checking in on you was he was he yeah. guiding you towards he what he wanted he's he's incredibly involved and and a remarkable collaborator because he's his attention to detail and the amount of research he has so many research assistants and um if he doesn't know something he's very honest about it and then he goes out and he finds the information and so we were able to bounce off each other so many ideas and it was such a fun time because we, we would, I would send him a clip and of Elvis scratching his face or something. I go, why do you think he did that at that moment? And we'd go back and forth and, and find <laughs> these, these little things. That's you know? great. And, um, and I, I often say that Baz is, is the closest thing to a jazz musician in a director that I've ever seen. And, and Tom and I talked about that as well, because in order to play jazz, you have to know your scales inside and out. You have to know music theory like no other. But then once you're on stage and you're performing, there's this improvisation that's, yeah. that's happening right now in this moment. Yeah. And that's how Baz is. He, he works so hard and he lives it for so many years. And then finally you're on the day and he may say, let's change all the words in the scene. Or how about you sing a song you never sung before? And everything changes. And that that's so terrifying. <laughs> but Leo warned me before I started the film. He, he, he didn't warn me. He, he, he was saying how much he loves working with Baz. And he said, you're going to absolutely adore it. And he said, but I'll tell you, Baz is going to constantly keep you off balance. But it'll pull things out of you you never knew you had inside you. And so I thank Baz for that, for for constantly pushing me right to the edge of what I thought was possible. Wow. Is there a specific moment in the film where that, yeah. that applies? Yeah. The first one I think of is um, the moment where we're rehearsing for the Vegas show. We'd had, we'd had a pre-recorded song that, that was essentially the, the creation of the Vegas show. So it's, yeah. it's us singing that's our mama. And, uh, and so it was to a click track. There was a moment where the piano comes in for four bars and then the drums for this many bars and the trombones at this point and the singers at this point. So th we'd, we'd been practicing it like a dance to that pre-recorded song. Then we got there on set and we did it once that way. And, and Baz kind of, I saw him there and he was, he, it was one of the first times I saw him not look fully happy. And my heart started to kind of flutter and I was thinking, what's, what's happening here? And right. he goes, you know, I'm thinking, they're all real musicians, right? And the musical supervisor, Elliot, was like, yeah, yeah, but their, their instruments are muted. And he goes, what if we unmute their, music, their uh, instruments uh -huh. and you do it live? And what if I tell all the musicians to purposely play the song wrong? And Elvis, you got to, you've got to- You got to correct them. Correct them and yeah. make them play the song you're hearing in your head, orchestrate them. Yeah. That was terrifying because suddenly I didn't have a safety net of this pre-recorded track. And so then we did it and all the musicians, it sounded awful the first time. <laughs> and I nearly, and, and then it sounds awful and then cut and then, and, and so you feel like you're walking through mud or something. Right. And then, and then hair and makeup comes up to you, everybody's touching and, and then you're supposed to go into another take. And at a certain point I said, it's the only time I've ever 
almost had a panic attack where I said, you know, I need a second. I, I need to go into another room. And I went into another room for about 10 minutes and I had this pep talk with myself. And I realized I don't need to do it how the track was. I don't have, there's no perfect out there. All that it is, is that I hear the music in my mind and I take as long as I need to with any one of those instruments until they get it right. Because that's what Elvis would do. And so I went out there and if the piano wasn't right, I made him do it again. And I, and, and I, 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 it, it caused me to have to be the orchestrator in that moment. Yeah. And then suddenly it was this transcendental moment where I, I, I was completely out of my body and I felt like it, it was incredibly present. And, and Baz said that was one of his favorite scenes in the movie. Um, and so Likewise. I felt like we caught lightning in a bottle there through this, that experience. You know? That's amazing. Uh, so, so this immersion in the role, uh, and this immersion in the role of Elvis, yeah. tell me that you didn't immerse yourself in the same way when you played a member of the Manson family. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was different. That was different. <laughs> you got to draw a line somewhere. I, I, uh, with that, I, you know, I did all the, all the work on research and Red Helter Skelter and, and did the, you know, I worked with a couple of different dialect coaches on his voice and stuff, but, um, but no, the, 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 the most that I did was, uh, the, the closest thing to, to like living one of those moments was Quentin said, Hey, I want you to, uh, the night that we were walking up Cielo drive, he yeah. said, we were actually filming on Cielo drive. And he said, uh, and it was, it was the same time of year as like in August and, and, uh, it was two in the morning or something. We we're doing a night shoot. And he says, you know, I want you to walk up the walk that they did because they parked at the, at the base of the hill and they walked up. It was so creepy and weird. And, and so I, I walked up and, and you, you're walking up and you're thinking, this is what the air would have felt like that night. Oh, this wow. is what the bugs sounded like in the bushes. This is what the wind probably sounded like in the trees. This oak tree was probably here at that time. And it starts being this weird feeling. And we're walking up this hill and then this guy who who lives in one of the houses on the Cielo Drive walks out, and he, he so he he lived in this little green house there, and he walks out and he goes, so you must be the killers, <laughs> and we're dressed in character and everything, and wow. and I go, I, I said, oh well, that's that's who we're playing, and he said, um, Sharon says you look just like Tex, and I look down at his lapel, and he has a Sharon Tate pin. And, and I realized that he is, feels like he's communicating with Sharon from beyond the grave. And he probably bought this house because he was obsessed with the murder. And he says, Sharon says, you look just like him. And then, and then he goes, how does it feel to play such a piece of shit? And he starts going on and on and on. And, and at this point I'm like walking up Cielo drive with this guy. And then I hear Quentin from down, down below. And he goes, Hey, get away from them. Get away from them. Come here. Come here. And he, and he pulls the guy down. And the guy walks down the hill. And I was like, what the hell? And then walk the rest of the way up Cielo drive with chills on my body. And we finally get up to the top and I just felt nauseous. It was just sickening. Um, Jeez. yeah, it was really sickening. It was wild. Oh my God! Well, that's a yeah. that's a hell of an experience. That, that, <laughs> yeah. that is for sure. Uh, yeah, thankfully uh, Quentin saved the day with that. <laughs> <laughs> Quentin to the rescue. Yeah. Uh, I've got to go in a second, Austin, but I, okay. I've got to ask about um, your next the next thing you're doing, which is Dune Part Two. Yeah, very excited about that. Oh, uh, man, I'm so excited. Uh, so uh, yeah, when, when when did you begin? I believe you've begun knife training and all that sort of stuff already. Yeah, I don't know how much I'm allowed to say about it. But what I can say is that Denis is truly one of my favorite filmmakers in this world. I think he's one of the greatest we've ever had. And I am just so honored and thrilled to be working with him. Mm. And the entire, I loved the first movie and, uh, yeah. and I, I can't wait to see what he's going to do with this one. Um, a lot of people are asking, or a lot of people are wondering because yeah. you're playing the role played by Sting, of course, in the David mm -hmm. Lynch movie. Uh, are there going to be space nappies this time around? Space nappies. Space uh, nappies. No comment. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be a hell of a thing. It really yeah. would be. Uh, the last thing I'm going to ask you, Austin, is, uh, as I've said, if I can dream, is my Elvis earworm yeah. at the moment? What's yours? I have so many, and it, and it depends on my day. I uh, Let's see, this morning, because I needed some energy, it was feeling in my body. I love that song. I remember the first time hearing that I thinking, don't know that I one. didn't know this is an Elvis song. Yeah. And then, and, and it's, it's got this, 
he, he, and the, the stacks recording listen to that okay there's there's a great they uh they they made a new with all these outtakes and stuff from the stacks recordings and you can hear i was talking on it and stuff there's a great recording of feeling in my body all right that's the one yeah, i'll check yeah, it out check it out after today. this uh, austin butler it's been an absolute pleasure thanks man. Right, thank you so thank much you. man